G'day, Chris here and welcome back to ClickSpring. Now as practical as this approach is for making gear cutters in the home shop, there's no one scale of the tools that'll give us exactly what we need in all circumstances. Eventually, we encounter the need to augment the basic setup to meet what I call the edge cases. For example, small module cycloidal wheels call for a button cutter geometry that becomes increasingly impractical the smaller we go. Certainly, the process of hand grinding high-speed steel covered in the previous video is a good alternative to consider. But if we're going to reliably create small module cutters, then we really need an option that's both dimensionally sound and a bit more convenient. And I found using old drill bits, or in this case, a small section of high-speed steel drill rod to be the perfect solution. They're both cheap and readily available sources of accurately sized high-speed steel that is of course designed for cutting and you can easily shape it to do exactly what you need. In this case, to form a spade drill to open up a hole in the shank that will hold it when forming the gear cutter profile. The key benefit of doing this is that the hole size is set by the very section of stock that will eventually occupy it. Now as it happens, a 1mm diameter circle corresponds to a cycloidal wheel module of approximately 0.26 and serves as a good representation of the process at this end of the wheel cutter scale. Much of the process remains exactly the same as for the button cutters. There must be clearance to permit unobstructed access to the blank, as well as relief to permit a clean cutting action. All of which can be achieved by appropriate shaping of the cutter shank and the cutting end of the drill rod. The cutter can then be fixed into the shank with either soft solder or by using a modern adhesive such as Loctite 609. And the result is the now familiar arrangement of a circular cutter with the appropriate radius being brought to bear on a gear cutter blank that is itself mounted on the eccentric arbor in the lathe. Aside from the need for extra care in ensuring accurate movement of the hand wheels, the procedure is now performed as you've come to expect with each side of each lobe profiled one at a time and then the blank flipped to complete the same cuts on the other side. The process results in quite a delicate cutter that nevertheless can be used in exactly the same way as we've become accustomed. And once hardened and tempered using the standard home shop techniques, the wheel cutting proceeds as you'd expect. Thank you. 
so not a whole lot changes when generating cutters for quite small mechanism using this method. Certainly, a little extra care is required when forming the cutter. At this scale, even an error as small as a hundredth of a millimetre will show up as a non-trivial error in the resulting profile geometry. But once the process is in hand, it really is quite straightforward to keep that to a minimum. In fact, it's possible to take this whole process much further, all the way down to a truly micro level without any great effort at all. So while we're here, let's have a quick look at that. Because as it happens, a 1mm circle also corresponds to the addendum curve for a 30 tooth involute gear of about module 0.1 and this tiny cutter profile. So you can see that at this scale, the challenge starts to become more about being able to clearly see what's going on to properly control the process. And certainly, even small errors now start to play quite a significant role in the outcome, requiring the very greatest of care to ensure a good result. Now of course considerable care is required to repeatedly manufacture anything at this scale and part of the reason why it's often so expensive. The key point though is that if you have the need you can operate on this scale with a very simple set of shop made tools and with care still get a respectable result. Ok so now let's head to the other end of the scale and have a look at what we need to do to accommodate the larger modules and in the case of the involute system the larger tooth counts. In this instance, you'll notice that the radius of that approximating circle is getting quite large, so again, alternatives need to be found. And one easy way to solve the issue is to make a disc cutter from a section of tall steel plate. It's still quite straightforward to get the cutting geometry that we need, beginning with a simple back taper on the lathe to generate a suitable relief angle. Although one small drawback of this type of disc cutter is that the profile will change as it's sharpened. But given what we're using it for, that's unlikely to be an issue for most of us. To begin with, because of its size, it can be rotated to bring a fresh cutting edge to bear at least four or five times before sharpening needs to be considered. And even then, sharpening removes so little material that it has little consequence if done infrequently. After quench hardening and then tempering, it's still relatively easy to bring up the cutting edge by hand using the same abrasive stones that we've been using so far in the previous examples. The main change to consider when using this sort of disc cutter is in the way that we hold it. And again, it's quite straightforward. A small angled flat of about 10 degrees, now on the underside of the shank, kicks the cutter back. So that we now have both a convenient back rake and clearance for the cutter. When using these larger cutters to form the involute profile, it becomes clear that it's most practical to use a similar approach to how we used a single button cutter for the cycloidal profile and that is to profile one half of each of the four lobes first and then flip the work and repeat the process for the other side. The key difference being that for the involute profile there's no concept of a flank angle in the geometry. So we simply feed in directly from the side using the cross slide of the lathe. This cutter has been specifically formed for cutting a 1.5 module 45 tooth gear to illustrate how to deal with a larger tooth count and module, particularly within the involute system. But more generally, this modified approach can be applied to generate both cycloidal and involute gear cutters. As the approximating curve is required to be larger to match a given tooth profile, in each case, it's simply a case of using a larger disc. And if you're required to operate out on the upper end of both tooth count and module at the same time, then transitioning to a section of a larger disc held directly in the lathe tool holder is yet another option that can be considered to still keep things practical. In this case, I'm cutting aluminium blanks, so a full depth of cut is dead easy for the cutter. But of course, if it's steel, then some sort of gradual cut is appropriate to help extend the cutter life.
So as with a small module, something much larger, like for example a replacement lathe change gear, is also well within the capability of the same set of tools. It does require care to manage things, as all of this starts to get larger, like for example the touch off against the work. But the basic process and the core tools remain the same, putting both ends of the gear cutting scale in reach as required. Ok, now for a quick word on gear tooth fillets. Because of course sharp corners at the root of gear teeth are a stress riser that we generally try to avoid. This additional profile component is fairly straightforward to form, beginning with reading off the fillet radius from the calculator, and then using that data to form a suitable tool steel cutter on the mill. And if we have a quick look at the way the fillet is applied to the unfilleted profile, it's clear that the cutter needs to be open enough to permit a tangent intersection at both the flank and what will be the bottom of the tooth. Something that can be done with either a file or more quickly the belt sander. Once hardened and tempered, the cutting tool can be mounted on the same shank used previously to hold the disc cutters. Again it kicks back the tool to give a bit of rake while still ensuring clearance. The tool is visually oriented with the top slide, to make sure that the cut replicates what we saw in the profile image a moment ago, of a tangent at both the side and what will be the bottom of the tooth profile. Not much material is being removed here, and personally I find it best to do this by hand, by pulling through the spindle one cut at a time while feeding in a small amount on the top slide prior to each cut. And again, once each side is complete, the cutter blank is flipped, and the other side completed in exactly the same way. And so we have another 1.5 module 45 tooth gear cutter, similar to before. But this time with the more familiar root fillets that we would expect to see in a commercial gear cutter. As for all of the cutter profiles covered previously, the calculator and tools can be used to make a fly cutter version, giving you an alternative means of producing the filleted involute profile according to your workshop situation. Now there's a similar concept in the standard for the cycloidal profile. It's not so much a fillet as a full semicircular rounding of the whole tooth root, giving the so called round bottom profile. This profile is quite common in modern watch design. So you'll be pleased to know that it's easy enough to incorporate into the cutter geometry. There's not much of a change to consider from what's required for the involute fillets, other than it's a little bit easier to form because of the entire tooth root being rounded. The teeth are again revealed on the mill and the usual heat treating and sharpening routines apply. And this round bottom profile is a great example on which to finish this short series. 
because it shows what this cutter generating method is truly capable of. If we can bring two cutting shapes to bear on a blank to generate curves such as this, then of course why not more? There's really no particular limit. So pretty much any geometry that we have an application for can be formed as a profile and turned into an effective multi-tooth cutter. We can use the same methods and tools and the only additional thing we need is a mathematical representation of the profile, which in the horological context at least, we always have. So there are many more candidates for us to add to this system in the future, with various ratchet and escapement cutters at the top of the list. And so that brings us to the end of this deep dive into all things shop-made gear cutters, at least for the time being. To summarise, if you've ever wanted to get into making geared mechanism in the home shop, but the cutter costs have put you off, then one of the best ways to save yourself some money on the project is to use this approach to make your own gear cutters. The tools are easy to make and just on their own make a terrific set of introductory lathe and mill projects. The process works equally well for both the involute and cycloidal profiles, with not much operational difference between the two. And the tools will provide you with both multi-tooth and fly cutter options, giving an acceptable surface finish and geometry in the final product. The process is backed up by an easy to use calculator that provides you with all of the data you'll need to help keep the technical side of things as headache free as possible. And the entire system has room to expand around the core toolset to accommodate more cutter profiles as we encounter them. In short, this is an excellent method for making form relieved gear cutters that brings the process firmly within your control in the home shop. And it's well suited to a lot of the work that I have planned for the future. So be sure to keep an eye out for it as a key element of the upcoming projects. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.